please do. Okay, great. So we'll do housekeeping. Um, Chris, are you do housekeeping today, or is it? Did you, That's you me. Go, okay, go for All it. Right. Uh, welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Executive Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad. Um, and, to this, and to the same, um, to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate discussion. Uh, going forward, all Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Uh, for those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute you. If you're using um, your phone to join the meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. Rich Kim, um, um, may I do roll call vote? Please. Okay. Rhinus? Here. Savage? Here. Schreiber? Vanarelli? Here. We have quorum. Let me do liaisons. I don't see Selena or Bonnie. Um, Danielle's here. Chris is here. I don't see Brady's on. Oh, Lord, Lord, you Lord. Okay, here's Brady. Mm -hmm. And Lauren's here on behalf of Lack, I'm assuming. Yep. Okay. And Brady's here. Shannon's here. Great. Um, so I'll turn it back over to uh, Kim Rich if you want to do public comments. I don't see anybody in the waiting pool, right, Kim? There's no there, there's, there's nobody. No okay, great. Um, so we only have one agenda item today, um, Rich and Kim, and Danielle is going to be presenting um, for the Cal J grants. Great. Okay, so I will share my screen and get us started. Um, I'm hoping that the presentation will take 20 or so minutes. Um, but of course, stop me for questions at any point. And then we have, you know, kind of plenty of time built in for discussion um, of the scoring team's recommendations and we can kind of go from there. Uh, so uh, thank you all uh, for making the time today. We will be discussing and approving, hopefully, the 2022-2025 uh, Cal HFA foreclosure prevention grants. And before I jump into kind of the, the meat of the scoring process, the scores, funding recommendations, et cetera, um, I did want to provide a little bit of background and reminder information on this grant opportunity generally. So this is the grant making timeline for these grants. Um, starting in February, we began drafting the RFP and scoring rubric. The commission met in early March to uh, approve this timeline as well as the delegations of authority. Executive committee, you all met in um, mid to late March to approve the RFP and scoring rubric. The applications were due May 2nd and we've spent the last month and change um, reviewing those applications. Uh, again, today we intend to approve the grant awards and then over the next several weeks, staff will be sending out grant agreements and processing invoices to get us to that July 1 grant period start date. And again, as a reminder, the funding um, for these grants is coming from the California Housing Finance Agency or CalHFA and is part of 945 million that the agency received from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan Act to launch a mortgage relief program in response to the COVID pandemic. And most of that funding is providing financial assistance to cover past due mortgage payments, but um, they are allowed to use some of that funding for legal aid services and CalHFA has decided to subgrant 12 million of that 945 million to the commission and the state bar to administer as uh, legal aid foreclosure prevention grants. And again, as a reminder of the grant parameters, this funding opportunity was open to all 2022 IOLTA eligible QLSPs and support centers. The funding must of course be used on foreclosure prevention and home retention legal services. 
It is a three-year grant running from July 1 of this year through June of 2025. Uh, but CalHFA wanted to hit the ground running and get this money out um, as quickly as possible. And so grantees will be allowed to claim expenditures back one quarter to facilitate um, kind of a quick launch of these programs. Um, and of the 12 million, up to 8% is available for administrative costs, which leaves 11.04 million available for grants. And any unused administrative costs would of course be also rolled to the grantees. And then I just wanted to remind you of two grant parameters that are specific to uh, this funding opportunity and are quite different from our others. One is that the income eligibility threshold for these grants is 150% of area median income, which is higher than our typical indigency standard. And also programs must spend at least 40% of the grant funds on providing services to people from socially disadvantaged communities. So as I mentioned earlier, you all approved the rubric for this funding opportunity on March 23rd. Um, and that the RFP or request for proposal provides guidance for each row of the rubric, um, as well as definitions for what might be considered not addressed below meets and exceeds expectations. We also reiterated to programs in that RFP that the rubric is a tool to guide scoring team and committee evaluations. Therefore, a high score does not necessarily guarantee funding and the scoring team and committee can exercise discretion in making awards that distribute grants statewide, as well as strive for diversity of interventions. Uh, so I apologize for the small text here, but just wanted to put the rubric in front of you again and remind you that the rubric categories here were project impact, which programs could receive up to 30 points for, um, and it is really getting at its heart, um, evaluating or measuring the um, impact of the project, how many folks they would be serving, for example, um, and asks that the project um, propose or propose, the applicant propose a project that significantly and directly addresses a compelling need for the services. There's a rubric category for administration, which is uh, uh, worth up to 20 points, which is conceptually the same as prior rubric categories around organizational capacity. So it looks at staffing, qualifications, resources, and the like. And then uh, we have a couple rubric categories that are specific to Cal HFA, one of which is outreach strategy targeting low-income homeowners. This was something that was really important to Cal HFA, the agency, uh, that programs think through how they would reach the folks that are eligible for these services. Similarly, there's a rubric category on focus on socially disadvantaged populations. Um, because programs need to spend at least 40% of the grant on serving those folks, CalHFA wanted to ensure or um, have us ensure that applicants have been thoughtful about how they'll identify and target those populations. Um, and also programs could receive higher points in this category for proposing to serve, um, use more than 40% of their funding to serve those groups, for example. The next rubric category is evaluation, which is pretty standard and asks um, how the applicant will acquire data that it can use to refine the project strategy over the course of the grant. And then finally, projects could um, earn up to five special consideration points for articulating a focus on and demonstrating a history of serving traditionally underserved populations or populations disproportionately impacted by COVID. And that was really because this funding was coming out of pandemic relief um, funding. So the, the, we received 22 applications seeking about $26.3 million combined. And as a reminder, we have $11.04 million to distribute. Those 22 applications, uh, 20 came from QLSPs and two were from support centers. And given the short timeline to review proposals ahead of that July 1 date, the committee delegated authority to a scoring team to score all the proposals. And that scoring team was comprised of three state bar staff members, myself, Chris McConkie and Duan Nguyen, and two committee members, Kim Savage and Christina Vanarelli. 
The scoring team met over five sessions to dis uh, discuss all of the proposals, score all of the proposals, as well as reach funding recommendations. And I also wanted to flag that Cal HFA staff sat in on most of those sessions. I believe we had a Cal HFA representative at four of the five or for part of at least four of the five sessions. Uh, Cal HFA staff were not part of the scoring team, but were available to provide additional details on their program goals and priorities and provide additional context or color to the conversation, which was really valuable. So after reviewing all 22, the five person scoring team arrived at consensus scores for every single proposal. Of the 22 proposals, the highest score on the scoring rubric was 88 out of a possible 100 points. The lowest score was 62 and the average score was 77. The scoring team is recommending the 11 proposals that are on this slide as well as in the memo. And together, these 11 uh, represent the nine highest scoring proposals, those that scored 80 or above on the scoring rubric, as well as two proposals that were chosen because they would serve otherwise unserved or minimally served areas of the state. And those are Legal Aid Society of San Diego and Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. Uh, Corrine will tell you a little bit more about that when uh, we talk about the map attachment a little bit later. And then for those 11 recommended applicants, we then needed to split the $11.04 million uh, across those proposed applicants. When we were considering as a scoring team what funding to recommend, we looked at the proportionality of the project deliverables to the funding request, the degree of fiscal conservatism in the budget given the narrative explanation, and the applicant's capacity to implement an impactful project with less than the full amount. So what that looked like in practice is we started uh, with all proposals ranked um, or sorted, if you will, by their score on the scoring rubric from highest to lowest. And then Dwan, Chris, and myself, at least two, if not all three of us, looked at every single budget um, and looked at you know if it made sense and seemed in line with the deliverables that they were proposing or if it seemed inflated um, or you know, reasonable to us and had that conversation then as a full scoring team, all five of us to get to our funding recommendations. With the recommended funding levels, which I'll have on the next slide, these 11 organizations would receive on average 82% of their full request. And um, I also reached out and asked each grantee kind of whether and how they would have to adjust their deliverables if they received the recommended amount. So I'm happy to provide that additional detail and color um, during the discussion if that would be helpful. And then this table provides, again, the 11 that we're recommending for funding, their score, um, the full amount that they requested in comparison to what the scoring team is recommended they be funded at. So you'll see that some of these, particularly in the middle here, their um, recommended funding amount is very close to their requested or exactly their requested in this case. Um, but there's a few that are very close, whereas others had much steeper cuts. Um, particularly, you'll see San Diego, Legal Aid Society of San Diego was an especially deep cut. Um, that was in part because they're kind of under that 80% threshold and we wanted to provide more funding to San Diego County for geographic reasons, um, but also that budget um, frankly felt very inflated to us when we looked at it, kind of the budget compared to the um, deliverables and the budget narrative. We had some concerns about its size, um, which is why that one has a particularly deep cut. Actually, before I move on to the grant management assessment, are there any questions at this point? Um, I'm happy to pause for a moment. Okay, hearing none, I will roll right along. So since this is a federally funded grant, uh, the state bar is required to evaluate the risk of non-compliance with federal statutes, regulations, statutes, regulations, grant terms, and conditions posed by each applicant. Uh, this is something that's relatively new. Um, so we, the state bar staff, particularly our fiscal team in the Office of Access and Inclusion, 
created a grant management assessment or GMA, uh, which includes a self-assessment component as well as a state bar sta staff assessment component. And together the GMA asks about or considers each organization's grant management staff and policies, internal control policies, audit history, history with federal grants. Those first three bullets um, were largely kind of captured in the self-assessment component. And then the state bar staff assessment component looked at things like the grantees history or applicants history of late submissions of grant materials to the state bar, history of large budget modifications and carryover requests, any substantial monitoring visit findings from state bar monitoring visits and state bar eligibility concerns. Uh, so whether they needed to go in front of or were asked to go in front of uh, eligibility and budget review committee or the full commission, that was also a consideration. And I did want to reiterate, we said this in the memo, but to say it here as well, the GMA is a tool to assess the level of technical assistance and oversight needed to support grantees. So all of this information was taken and each grantee received basically a, a rating or evaluation of high, medium or low risk. Um, but being medium or low risk does not necessarily indicate that um, that program is or will be a problem. It just indicates that we as a state bar staff and um, kind of pass through for funding in this grant opportunity, will need to provide greater uh, technical assistance and oversight and kind of make sure they, they have what they need to be successful to understand and comply with the federal requirements. And so when we did that process for the um, College of Bay applicants, these are the GMA results for the 11 that are recommended for funding. You'll see it is a mix of high, medium and low risk applicants. Because of that, state bar staff are planning to provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to all the programs, but particularly the programs that were rated medium or high risk to make sure they have, for example, the internal control policies that are required by federal regulations um, and kind of just help them, again, further understand and comply with those federal requirements. Um, I will also say that the GMA results did not um, factor into scoring the proposals in terms of their scoring rubric uh, score because it wasn't part of the scoring rubric. It wasn't um, in the RFP, for example, but um, some factors that may lead to a medium or high risk on the GMA, for example, a history of non-compliance would speak to the administration organizational capacity row of the scoring rubric. So it wasn't formally part of the scoring process, but I think there's some kind of common threads, if you will. Are there any questions on the GMA? And I also have, um, we have Heidi Slater here from our fiscal team who helped kind of develop it, if there's any questions specific to that. Okay, hearing none. So taken together, these 11 projects that are recommended for funding all articulate a clear nexus to foreclosure prevention and all proposed projects with really strong impact. All 11 of these either scored um, meets or exceeds expectations in that impact rubric category. They also together would serve every county in the state and would particularly focus on 54 of the 50 counties in the state, which is great. Um, and again, Karina will tell you a little bit more about that um, in the map in a moment. And it would also balance uh, QLSP and support center services. So nine of these recommended projects are from QLSPs and two are from support centers. Finally, all 11 of these recommended projects uh, scored exceeds expectations in at least one rubric category, but most of them scored in, in two or more and some scored in even three or four rubric categories, which is great. And nearly all, I think all but one, scored at least two points um, in special consideration, which again was a range of zero to five for serving disproportionately, or I'm sorry, underserved or um, disproportionately impacted by COVID. So I will turn it over to uh, Kareen, and I apologize for this map being a little small. I'll zoom in a little bit, um, but I will stop talking and let her tell you a little bit about the map. Thank you, Danielle. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Corinne Chung, and I'm a rising junior at Harvard studying government and economics, and I'm an intern for the program division um, of the State Bar of California this summer in the Los Angeles office. Danielle and Duan have given me the opportunity to assist with some of the supplementary materials for this memo, and I'll be giving a, a brief overview of the map that you are currently seeing on your screen. So this map represents the nine organizations that have submitted project proposals that would focus their services on particular counties. As you can see, the recommended proposals offer various services across California. This level of wide coverage is rare and very beneficial to various communities across the state. In addition, there are two organizations that would offer statewide services and are not included on this map. Um, those two organizations are the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform and the National Housing Law Project. So essentially every county would benefit from the recommended projects. And Danielle mentioned this briefly in the beginning, but it's also worth noting that although the Legal Aid Society of San Diego and the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino scored slightly lower than the other organizations and their proposals, these two recommendations were included to ensure adequate services to these larger counties. San Diego is the second most populous county in the state and Riverside and San Bernardino are the fourth and fifth most populous counties respectively. These two organizations would address the issues of the most populous inland empire counties otherwise being minimally served by this grant. Great, thank you for that. Um, and again, are there any questions? I think the next slide actually, um, the next slide just lists the attachments that were included with this memo, um, which is the request for proposal. There's a spreadsheet of the scores and uh, funding recommendation uh, profile sheets if you want a little more information on any of the proposals, both those that are recommended and those that are not. Also, attachment D is a blank grant management assessment tool if you want to see the details of the questions that were asked uh, in evaluating whether programs were low, medium, or high risk. And then finally, the map um, that Corinne just walked you all through. But that is the end of our formal presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions or you know open the floor for committee discussion at this point. Kim, Christina, did you want to add anything about the review process or your thoughts? Christina? <laughs> you can go first or I will. Uh, I mean, I think Danielle covered. I think we worked really well together. It was, um, felt like a lot of them in a short amount of time and we were able to come together and there wasn't really any great disagreement. And I think, you know, there was how many, five of us looking at these and nothing really controversial they were very good yeah I have, to, I have to echo that we we worked really well as a team we didn't always agree but with discussion we did eventually come to consensus so it was a really good process and it was so nice having two commissioners review the whole set I know it was incredibly a, a large amount of work for Kim and Christina both in a short amount of time they're very busy and they met with us five times over the course of five weeks I believe five or six weeks so it was um, a, a big time commitment um, from the two of you so we want to thank you yes so I would agree with, with what both Christina and Duan what they've said I, I think that the, the, the number of people involved worked really well because between the five of us, um, some people picked up on different things mm -hmm. and um, that was extremely helpful. Um, so yeah, it was, I, I thought it was a great process. It was a bit intense, but um, <laughs> we got through it. Yeah. I, I'm very impressed, I, I have to say. And I wonder if the GMA tool might be used uh, in the future for other purposes. You know, yeah. we actually had that question by our executive staff and, um, you know, it's, it's been really well received. We previewed it with our own auditors who are very impressed by it. So it is something definitely um, this this tool will be used for the homelessness prevention grant as well. We're using the same tool for all, all of our federal grants, um, but it is something to think about for IOLTA and EF where, you know, we're not required to, but perhaps adopting something like that in the future um, could, could help provide, you know, more in-depth TA. So it's something the fiscal team um, is is going to be um, considering. It's very impressive, and I'm sure it could be useful. Mm -hmm. The homelessness prevention grants, especially. Yeah, and Heidi did a really great job. Um, you know, Heidi came from a, a program that they receive a lot of funding, so she brought like that background in developing this tool. Um, Heidi, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about the development or, or your, kind of your thoughts. Sorry, I turned my camera off because I was trying to have a little lunch while I was listening. Um, 
Yeah, the GMA, when you factor in the homelessness prevention grantees, it basically 73% or so of our grantees will be under sort of its umbrella because we're using the same tool for the homelessness prevention. Um, and so I do think that um, it is something to consider when you have 73% of your grantees under sort of one umbrella and then this 25% other umbrella, it may be something worth calibrating across the board. Uh, the standards for the federal government are higher than the for compliance issues related to sort of fiscal performance um, and whatnot. Um, so that might be something we want to consider. Um, you know, sort of smoothing out those those differences, because I do think it's, a, you know, it's a higher standard and it is a higher burden on the staff. So it is there are resource issues related to using it um, in IOLTA and EAF. So that would have to be sort of ironed out. But I do think that there are some some good um, practices in the, for the federal government standards that our programs probably would benefit from. And, and you know, now that our grant like funding has grown over the years, our fiscal team has grown. Um, not, and not, it's not just our program, but our fiscal team. There used to be only one senior financial analyst, and now we have Michael and Heidi, and we're hiring one more senior financial analyst just because of the volume of um, both TA and review that we have to do. It's, it's just a lot more. Okay. The whole no, the whole notion of risk assessment, it strikes me, is a new layer of mm -hmm. protection and one that uh, ought to serve us very well. Yeah, it, it definitely is new. I mean, I, th I think we've adopted it, but not in a direct way like this and formalizing it and having actual tools and publishing it. I, I think it will go far in terms of like enhancing um, across the board for our, our programs, helping them strengthen their internal controls. So Tuan, um, you, you said the magic word for me is publishing it. I mean, I think the pro both the, the, the programs need to understand yeah. Um, about how the tool will be used and what, you know, how it measures, I mean, full disclosure. And then um, also, I think the commission needs to be informed of this. I think it'll be heartening, particularly for the new members to see that we do a careful um, risk analysis. No, and, um, you know, Heidi did a really good job, like, publicizing it before they, the, the, the programs actually um, filled out the risk assessment. And we wanted to, 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 it to be something manageable. So it's designed so that they can complete it. I think it was under 20 minutes, right, Heidi, their portion of it. And then the other piece of it was um, a, a more of a heavy lift on the staff side. Where we could, we, we pulled the information. And then where we couldn't, we asked for them to, to, um, to provide that. But, but, but I think you're right. Maybe perhaps at the commission meeting, there's already this agenda item. Um, but maybe, Heidi, you can, you can go into a little bit more detail about the risk assessment, how you developed it, um, and maybe walk people through the, the tool itself. I know you guys include it as a blank, but uh, maybe just at a high level. Like spend five well, yeah, and, and the one thing I'll add is this, this was our first go at it. So, you know, as I'm, I'm scoring the HP3, you know, there may be refinements that mm -hmm. sort of come out of the, the process, you know, and sort of when you look at a bigger pool, you can see sort of how... Uh, the risk assessment gets um, you can you can see more when you do a bigger pool. So there might be some refinements that I might want to sort of look at making because there are it's skewing in in certain ways, you know, for certain you know certain things that may over time not be as big of a risk as they might be weighing out in this mm -hmm. particular rendition. And when we were in consideration for um, to be the recipient of the CalFH A grant. Um, from CalFHA, they did the a risk assessment of us and we scored, um, it was low risk on our side. So, um, you know, everybody that's a recipient of federal funds has to go through this. So it's good now, you know, we have a, the infrastructure now we built out in a very short amount of time, but we, we do have it up and running. So it's great. Well, one, of, one of your 11 uh, candidates for, or, or who will soon be approved uh, is the legal services of San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. And one of the categories was historical risk. Uh, and, and of course they've had their historical risk. I, I'm real pleased to see that they were included and were able to navigate through all this. Yeah, and I think that's a great example. I think of what Heidi was referencing earlier about there maybe some aspects of this um, GMA that are really important to include, but maybe like the, the weight of them will change or tinker over time. 
um, because one of them is, you know, LASSB, as you mentioned, had some governance issues. And I think that'll always be a, a relevant factor to the GMA. But like one of the other risk factors or things that we look at is large carryover and um, budget modification requests. And I think right now it looks at the last three years and the last three years from this point is gonna cover you know, 2019, 2020 COVID anomalies, which may be less prevalent, hopefully moving forward. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how some of that shakes out as the GMA kind of iterates over time. Great, so if there's no other discussion or questions, uh, the proposed resolution here, I can read this out loud, says resolve that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Executive Committee approves the following 2022-2025 CalHFA foreclosure prevention grant recipients and amounts. Uh, and this table is exactly the same as the one on the prior slide. I just removed the column um, that has the difference between their requested amount and their recommended amount. I'll move that we approve the resolution. All second. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me do a roll call vote. Um, Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Venerelli? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Thank you all so much. That was very <laughs> quick and efficient. <laughs> you. Great job. Job well done. <laughs> great job, you guys. Yeah. Rich, thank, Rich, thank you for, for coming on. I know it's in the middle of family festivities, but thank you. Appreciate it yes, very thank much. You. Thank well, you, Rich. From the birth of Lake Michigan, I wish you all a good <laughs> <laughs> Thank we'll you. We'll see you all in a few days then. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much.